Good evening, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of the Concord Bookshop, welcome. We want to extend thanks to the Trinitarian Congregational Church for sharing their space with us this evening. Thanks, too, to Rob Mitchell with the Concord Festival of Authors and to Frank Breen from Carlisle Video. We are all in for a treat tonight. After Alice is a new tale inspired by Lewis Carroll's classic, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Gregory Maguire's novel centers on Ada, a young neighbor of Alice, who is constricted by both a social awkwardness and a brace worn to straighten her misshapen spine. Ada slips into the rabbit hole after Alice, losing both her back brace and her inhibitions as she falls. She, not Alice, takes center stage in this adventure, which is indeed curiouser and curiouser and full of wonder, witty wordplay. Meanwhile, life above the rabbit hole in Oxford carries on, where a governess and an older sister half-heartedly look for the two girls, ceding to the demands of a self-medicated new mother, a baby that won't stop crying, and a cameo appearance by Charles Darwin. <laughs> Gregory Maguire once again shows that there's a fine line between childhood and adulthood, and that the redemptive power of imagination is available to all of us. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the publication of his novel, Wicked, the first in the best-selling Wicked Years series. Gregory, as you know, has published dozens of novels for adults and for children, including most recently, Egg and Spoon. Tonight, he will present a dramatic re reading from After Alice with musical selections from flautist Catherine Kleitz. And after the reading, he'll be signing books for you. We're using those colorful tickets to help um, order the signing queue. Please put your hands together for Gregory Maguire. A reading from the book of Lewis Carroll. <laughs> Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time she went on talking. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went on just as usual. I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, that's the great puzzle. And she began thinking over all the children she knew that were of the same age as herself to see if she could have been changed for any of them. I'm sure I'm not Ada, she said, for her hair goes in such long ringlets, and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. 
And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and she, oh, she knows such a very little. <laughs> Besides, she's she, and I'm I, and oh dear, how puzzling it all is. Ada, on the riverbank, on her way to visit her friend Alice, meets Alice's older sister, Lydia. Oh, the book, said Lydia. Papa thrust it at me and told me to read it to Alice, but you know Alice. I was trying to do as I was told. The piece is about a Shakespeare play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. I doubt you've heard of it. Father deplores the stage, vice in three acts, he says. Curious, I didn't know there were that many acts of vice. <laughs> Lydia had 15 years to Ada's 10, and everything the older girl said sounded as if it meant more than Ada could understand. Ah, well, it would be easier to watch this Falderall than it is to read about it, Lydia yawned. Alice was here a moment ago. Perhaps she has wandered over to look at the stork nest. You might find her there. Lydia pointed to some imprecise horizon. You know our Alice. She plays hide and seek, but sometimes forgets to ask someone to look for her. I'll continue on to your home and perform my duty. What a little prig you are. Stay out of Darwin's way or he'll turn you into a monkey. Or maybe an ass. Lydia flapped one hand at Ada. She turned a page of her book with the other. Then she paused. Is someone calling after you? Surely not, said Ada. Is that your governess? What is her name? Miss Armstrong? That tightly sprung woman from Wolverhampton? She made Wolverhampton sound like purgatory. <laughs> Holy hell, said Ada. I'll be going now. The language of you young people, Lydia sighed. So few years on Ada, yet such opportunity for condescension. <laughs> Hide and seek, you too? I may pretend to be dozing so as not to have to speak to your governess, though I suppose in any case she can sniff you out, your medicinal <laughs> cologne. Ada didn't reply. She hurried to the other side of the tree, where a companion tree joined it at the ankle. The pair leaned out over the water, and Ada tried to lean along with them so that they would conceal her. The double trunk split into tuberous roots, forming a proto-Gothic archway in the sandy bank just inches above the river. From that join, Ada saw a nose and then a face emerge, twitching. A denizen of the riverbank worried itself out, Adjusting his waistcoat and standing erect, he turned this way and that. He seemed not to notice Ada. She was in the shadows. He didn't, she didn't care, dare call out to Lydia for fear she would startle the creature. But really, a white rabbit in a gentleman's waistcoat? Who could possibly have run, run up that snug apparel and struggled him into it? Miss Lydia! 
called Miss Armstrong, brisking along the path that meandered toward the riverbank from the outcrop of distant homes. I was to accompany Miss Ada on her perambulations, but she left the vicarage before I was ready. I am quite cross with her. Ada didn't dare move. She watched Lydia expertly drop her head back upon the grassy bolster as if in slumberland. Good, she would not give Ada away. Ada leaned farther along the slant of the trees, trying to become more shadow. The rabbit had hopped a few feet toward the sunlight, but at the sound of Miss Armstrong's voice, he froze. The time has got away from me, cried Miss Armstrong. I couldn't locate my gloves. Miss Lydia, is Ada about? Have you seen her? Then her voice dropped. She had noticed Lydia's closed eyes. Beg pardon, <laughs> whispered Miss Armstrong and turned this way and that as if <sniffs> sniffing for Ada. All at once, Ada found that she'd stepped into the rabbit hole. If she didn't get loose, she'd be stuck here, clenched by soil and tree root, pounced upon by her persecutrix. She put the marmalade jar in the pocket of her pinafore and reached down to dig her foot out. Though mere inches from the river, the sandy soil was dry and easily shoveled away. Still, bending at the waist was hard labor for Ada. Before she could retract her ankle, a sub-flooring of rotted root mass gave way. She was in, as far as her knee. She knelt, she had no choice, and she scrabbled at the yielding earth. She was swallowed up by the ground, just as she had hoped would happen to Miss Armstrong in Ifley Churchyard. <laughs> she found herself falling into darkness. Ada has fallen into a pool of tears, which looks quite a bit like an ocean. Drifting underwater, Ada felt as if she must have missed the ark, along with the unicorns and behemoths and centaurs and other veiled species. She was doomed to extinction any moment now. In the picture from her children's book, as she recalled it, bearded Noah looked like her reverend father, making no effort to notice his daughter flailing beneath the waves. Her mother was below decks, with her chin in an Old Testament chalice of Madeira. There was no cook on board the ark, as far as Ada knew. Ireland hadn't been invented yet. Ada had a suspicion that Noah's newborn infant son had trotted along on all fours and tripped up his big, ungainly sister, making her sprawl and tumble overboard into the flood. Sororicide. <laughs> then, to her surprise, she broke through. But broke through what? It seemed, at least, to be the surface of the water, perhaps more, as in the landscapes of the Inferno by Doré, an impossible, outlandish sky lolled overhead with an unsettling suggestion of eternity. She was naked, but she suspected she hadn't been made corporeally perfect in her plunge. I say, called a voice, I do hope you're not drowning. She looked about for a boat, for Noah and his ark, for Charon and his bark, anyone on duty? She saw no boat, but as she pivoted, 
how much easier it was to move in the water than on land, she discovered that she was close to a strand. A couple of peculiar looking creatures were making their way along the beach from left to right. A walrus walking hand in hand with a laborer of some sort. A difficult thing to accomplish, given that walruses sport nothing approximating a hand. Still, there was no other way to put it. The human had some obscure tools of his trade poking from a pocket in his laborer's leather apron. Neither of them looked like Charon, nor like Noah. Perhaps the human, who seemed to be a joiner, had learned shipbuilding from Noah, while the walrus had survived the flood because, of course, walruses swim adequately enough. I may be drowning, she called. Please don't, came a reply. They had stopped and were peering at her. The walrus was speaking. We just saw a sign that said, drowning is forbidden and punishable by death. <laughs> the queen is ruthless about misbehavior of that sort, added his companion. If one drowns, one can't then be put to death, said Ada. She pollywogged nearer the shore, keeping her bare shoulders submerged. I don't know why you say that. One can drown one's sorrows in a flask of herring cordial. But the sorrows always return, said the walrus. They don't stay drowned. They can be put to death again, happily enough. He was a walrus who looked as if he knew something considerable about sorrow. Then again, thought Ada, perhaps most walruses look like that. <laughs> Why is an oyster like a writing desk? asked the tradesman. Ah, my friend, said the walrus to Ada, is a carpenter, and he knows many useful things about writing desks, as we are just returning from a breakfast with oysters. Perhaps he intends to write about it. To the carpenter, the walrus said, an excellent riddle. My dear man, the very wet child beyond me have an opinion on the matter. Why is an oyster like a writing desk? called the carpenter in a voice keyed to falsetto. Ada had found purchase with her feet now, so she could stop rotating her arms and knees. She said musingly, why is an oyster like a writing desk? That's our riddle, remarked the walrus. Don't ask it back to us. You can ask one of your own if you have one. I'm pondering, why is an oyster like a writing desk? She reviewed the conversation they'd had. I, I think I know. An oyster is like a writing desk because neither can be drowned. That's the correct answer, <laughs> said the walrus. He drooped his mustaches farther than usual. You're good. <laughs> Do I get a prize? asked Ada. Where I come from, riddles are sometimes tests to prove the merit of the hero. If the hero guesses the answer correctly, very often a door is opened unto him. Well, if a hero comes along, we'll open the door for him, said the walrus. That's your prize. And if there isn't a door, I'll build one, said the carpenter. Do you have a riddle for us? Ada knew only one riddle. When is a door, not a door. The pair of beachcombers looked at each other from beneath whiskery eyebrows. The walrus shrugged. It is a dreadful mystery, whispered the carpenter. <laughs> no one can ever know the answer to that question. It is existentially, hyperbolically, quintessentially unknowable. I know it, and I'll tell you, said Ada proudly. A door is not a door when it is a jar. A jar of what? asked the walrus. Jellyfish jam, I hope? Mackerel marmalade? No, a jar. It's a word that means open, standing open. The carpenter slapped his palm against the walrus's upturned flipper, and they danced a bit of a quadrille, as well as they could without six partners. Well, that settles that then, said the carpenter. Am I right or am I right? Is that another riddle? Asked Ada. What do I get if I answer that one correctly? A further chance to fail, said the carpenter. 
He stopped cavorting, and the two of them began to trudge away. It might be worth considering for a moment if the built landscape inspires in authors the invention of romantic individuals. Of course, architecture is impervious to rants, petitions, to shrieks of rape and the murder of martyrs and all the other human noise. But is one of the satisfactions of carved space, that is, massive stone laid just so, that it calls out for the creation of heightened characters to live up to it? Even if those outsized characters are ourselves, our own cleansed, resolved natures? The ancient Greeks may have thought so. Drama was perhaps invented by the natural amphitheater and not the other way around. The medieval masons of Chartres and Rem built windowed bluffs that laddered light into the heavens. And peasants, in perceiving their own rights to salvation, began to imagine other rights, too. So, Oxford, at its inception, a huddle of theologians and divines grew into a city of dreams, and much good may come of that. Little surprise that Middle-earth and Narnia were both discovered here. <coughs> Yet, this story takes place outside of the most famous sites. No murder in the Sheldonian, no undergraduate lust in the reading room of the Radcliffe Camera, no academic intrigue in the senior common room of Balliol, no capering over the leads of Christ Church, no spicy infidelities in the back passage at the Ashmolean. No spiritual remorse before William Holman Hunt's The Light of the World. Most of this story takes place on Oxford's margins, the area where the maps of famous buildings and renowned sites tends to pale and give out. The undifferentiated reaches marked Hic Sunt Dracones beyond the old town walls. You won't identify the exact mile of riverbank that ties together the lives of those in the vicarage and those of the croft. The river changes its course by grains of mud every day imperceptibly. A rural district yields indifferently to development, plot by plot. And once the college is open to women, 15, 25 years hence, the late Victorian houses of Norham Gardens and the like, those anxious, fanciful, tall, narrow brick ships moored behind their garden gates up and down each lane, will obliterate this scrap of unsanctified North Oxford. It will remain only here on these pages. Perhaps we love our Oxford because it seems eternal. And we can return arm in arm, while our private childhoods are solitary, unique to each of us alone, and lost. We cannot point them out to one another. Only sometimes, in the text of a book here and there, we tap the page with a finger and we say, this, this is what my lost days were like, something like this. 
but even as we turn to the fellow in the bed beside us to say, yes, this passage here, whatever it is we recognized has already disguised itself, changed itself in that split instant. There is no hope that our companion can see what we just for a moment saw anew and held with a startled, glad heart. Literary pleasure and a sense of recognition and identification, real though they are, burn off like alcohol in the flame of the next heated moment. later in the day. For the first time, Lydia, Alice's sister, began to wonder seriously if she should be frightened for Alice. It would be a novel exercise, both because Lydia's capacity for raw emotion had been so overwhelmed in recent months that until today, She'd imagined she could never feel anything deeply ever again. And also because, well, Alice. Alice was immortal. Alice was immortal in a way their mother had not been. It had to do with Alice's strange Gravitas, her unerring solidity. Death wouldn't come near her, it wouldn't dare. And mind, this was not the immortality that children demonstrate blindly. Children who, because they do not know that they will die, behave as if it cannot happen. Sooner or later, we grow into deserving our own deaths, somehow. Alice was different. She was rectitude and curiosity and bravery. She was stubbornness and tolerance. Something of her childhood always seemed to slip out of her as if through permeable membranes, as if she were one of Darwin's anomalous specimens. Alice was an ordinary child whose unordinary childhood seemed an infectious condition to those who came near her. Lydia often felt like a bit player, a common sort of business, her own existence merely some adumbration ornamenting the life of her weird sister. The spider under the table at the Last Supper, the cat who looked at a king, the king is history. Where the cat went next is not recorded. And yet, Lydia had been pacing along the path as she mused, and now she had reached the place on the riverbank where she had stopped earlier that day. Look, she dropped her book of commentary on Shakespeare's Midsummer Dream, and she'd never noticed. There it still lay in the meadow grass, and yet, and yet, who else to play the part of a bit player in the life of a child? What is a parent but a sort of valet <laughs> to the royalty of innocent youth? With Mrs. Cloud gone and Mr. Cloud lost in grief, Alice had no one else. And Lydia was all she had and not enough. 
Lydia paused and sat down and leaned against the tree. She put her hands to her face. She didn't care to think about her mother. She wasn't ready. Unwelcome, indeed forbidden, a memory rose up through the flooring of the day, a memory of Jane Cloud. Lydia tried to resist it, but memories are anarchic. Some winter morning a few years ago, Jane Cloud had come back from London, a visit to a surgery in Harley Street. Alighting from the carriage onto the glossy, ice-slicked cobbles of the lane, leaning to thank the driver and turning to greet her girls. Her hair had fallen out of its pins on one side. The bonnet was askew. Forsaking their December wear, the girls had pummeled down the path from the croft, meaning to throw themselves in her arms. Against the cold, one hand was still immersed in a white muff of rabbit fur. The other hand, gloveless, was reaching toward her girls. <laughs>